Thanks, uh, thank you very much. Please sit here. Thank you, George. Hello, guys. Thank you for joining us here at the University of Nicosia. Oh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Before we jump into exchanges and the crypto asset industry, we have some students in the audience. We have some young people who might be studying crypto assets and blockchains are going to start their career. Yeah. And from what I understand, you first became involved in the crypto asset space in 2013, yeah. which is about 10 years ago. And within a decade, you are now arguably the most important person in arguably. this space. Arguably. arguably. <laughs> I think that's a good argument. Anyway, one of a handful. And control an extremely significant organization. How did you do it? How did, how did this happen? Um, by luck. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, yeah, so I got into crypto in 2013. Uh, I was like an um, entrepreneur. I was like a startup guy back then. I've been uh, running a startup for eight years at that point, uh, but I was the most junior partner out of six, uh, six guys. Um, I've done a couple other different startups in between, um, and um, Binance is probably my fifth startup. Um, so it's also about like fourth. Uh, it's also like the fourth trading system that I, I was heavily involved with. Um, I, what I call the fourth generation trading systems. So I worked in. Um, I worked on the Tokyo Stock Exchange software back in the day, twenty something years ago. Uh, I worked in Bloomberg from the twenty. 2001 to 2005, working on future, uh, Bloomberg Tradebook Futures trading platforms. Um, and then I built my, what we, you know, our own startup, like a product called Raptor, which is an ultra low latency trading system. Um, and then I also worked at a crypto exchange when, in 2014. So 2017, Binance is like the fourth, fourth, fifth generation exchange system. So it took many years to get there. Um, and uh, um, yeah, and, but there's still a lot of luck involved. We were very lucky in 2017. Um, there was a change in the market. Um, it was changing from a Bitcoin industry to a, bad word, but ICO industry, like everybody's issuing a coin because thanks to Ethereum, uh, ERC-20 protocols. I think this crowd is probably a very technical crowd. Um, and um, the exchanges before us were mostly Bitcoin exchanges. Uh, I think at the time, Coinbase only list four coins. They have Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum was a new one in 2017 for them. Like, um, and then uh, we built an exchange that has all the ERC-20 tokens. There's a few other exchanges before us, Polonex and Butrex, they're still around. Um, but we uh, excelled at the customer support, the product, and more, more importantly, how to, how to protect our users. So we made many decisions that actually costed us a lot of money, but we protected our users. And today, the users are very, very smart. We have social media, people talk among each other, word of mouth is the strongest uh, marketing tool. So um, yeah, so we've we grown pretty quickly. Yeah. Okay, well, that was a very oh. humble answer to that question, but <laughs> I I'll take it. You mentioned you worked in traditional exchange infrastructure yeah. at the beginning of your career. How would you judge the maturity of the exchange infrastructure in crypto? From my possibly less limited, less limited understanding, it's still more unified, whereas in the traditional system, custody is often broken apart from the trading platforms and so on. Where are we? Is, that going to, is it in time going to look more like the traditional system, or is it different in crypto? Do they stay bundled? Um, I think the crypto exchanges are far more advanced than traditional exchange infrastructures, uh, in, especially in terms of technology-wise, uh, security-wise too. Um, so there are some fundamental differences. Um, th when you trade stocks, the stock exchanges only operate like a few hours a day. Um, they start at nine, typically finish at three, um, and then they can do all the all kind of stuff they, they want to do. Um, so system upgrades, uh, deployments, testing, reconciliation, all of this can happen uh, in batch jobs after the exchange is closed. Crypto runs 24 by 7. We don't close for Christmas. We don't close for anything. Um, so all the upgrades need to be done in real time. Um, secure, uh, 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 talk about security later. So it requires a very different type of uh, uh, structure. Um, and um, uh, security is very different. Um, uh, Traditional exchanges, uh, stock exchanges, they don't hold money. So the security is still very important, uh, data security, et cetera. But they, uh, hackers hack them, they just screw up 
their system. They don't really walk away with money. Um, if a crypt crypto exchange gets hacked, hackers get paid hundreds of mil billions of dollars. Um, so there's not much incentive for hackers to, to, to attack crypto exchanges. Security is top notch, um, or has to be. Um, it's forced to be. Um, and then um, um, traditional exchanges, because the custody is separate, um, they settle T plus one, T plus two, T plus three. They can reverse trades. Um, when you buy a stock, you may or may not have that stock tomorrow. Um, in crypto exchanges, it's T plus zero. It's real-time settlement. So you deposit Bitcoin, you buy Ethereum, you can withdraw it right away, and that's it, that's yours. Um, so there's many different type uh, te technologies that are very, very different. Um, and um, so uh, also, uh, crypto exchanges now, we are direct to consumer. Um, so Binance has about 120 something, 130 million users all around the world. So it's one matching engine servicing hundreds of millions of users hopefully soon, billions of users in every part of the world. Um, so traditional uh, stock exchanges, they have like a couple hundred brokers, uh, members that connect to them. They're typically co-location, co so they, they're in the same data center. Uh, retail guys put their orders to the brokers. The brokers mm, give them like 15-minute delayed quotes and stuff like that. It takes a couple seconds or a couple minutes to put the orders into the exchange system, this mm, potential front-running of um, different, different issues. Where we are like with the post internet era, um, so users in Africa, users here, users in Asia, users in other parts of the world, they can just place orders directly onto the, onto the exchange. And um, uh, when there's a slight delay, they complain. <laughs> um, so no one has done this before, really, before crypto exchanges. Um, uh, so if the closest you can think, I can think about is like Google, Facebook, Twitter. They have users all around the world. They, 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 they submit messages and they process them. But if you make a tweet and your friend doesn't see it for like, you no know, 30 seconds, you don't complain. That's OK. Mm -hmm. But if you place an order and you don't see it in three seconds and the price moved, you will complain. So we have to optimize out of the wazoo, uh, like you know this um, uh, uh, caching. Uh, we have to fix internet problems, uh, so that a user in Africa who has very slow internet can place an order and have a similar experience, and they get an acknowledgement very quickly. And all the orders have to go into the same matching engine because the previous order will change the price for the next order. So if, you know, in a central matching uh, order matching um, central uh, uh, order book. Uh, it's very different from Google. Uh, Google, you see the results from two users to see two different results. It's not a problem. So yeah. they can cache in a very loose way. We can't do that. Uh, all the orders have to come into the same single server um, because the previous order changes the price for the next one and there's pri uh, time uh, price priority. So all of these are challenges that have not been solved before. Uh, traditional exchanges don't deal with this at all, traditional stock exchanges. So, um, uh, but, but luckily, we're just one step uh, beyond the evolution. So we hired the best uh, internet, large internet application guys. We hired the best talent from Google, Facebook, Twitter, Tencent, um, et cetera. And then we say, look, fi figure out how to do this, uh, how, how, to fi how to solve this more challenging problem. So, but the technology is there. So um, we're kind of solving it now. Because we have a technical audience, I want a small follow up on the sure. technology part. Because let me set it, put it back in my words. Unlike let's say Google, that can cash domestically uh, an asset, and it doesn't matter if it's a minute, 10 minutes, 15 minutes old, it's not changing moment by moment. Yeah. You have exchanges around the world, users around the world, different amounts of latency for those users, and every order has to hit a centralized point yeah. as quickly as possible yeah. to get process and return, so you don't benefit as much from caching. Right? Yeah. What does this mean for your actual network infrastructure? Um, we st actually still benefit from caching. Uh, we cache actually out of the wazoo. Uh, we have like, I don't know, seven or 10 layers of caches. I'm not, tech yeah, I'm not no, that no. technical anymore. Um, so uh, uh, we still benefit from caching. Um, this, uh, but the real, uh, uh, there are market prices. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that you can still cache. Um, we, but we, we, we run a much, much more real-time cache. So um, uh, everything needs to be updated almost instantaneously. But without caching, that single server is not going to handle it. 
uh, no matter how big that server is or no, how big that server cluster is, you still got to have layers of fan outs. Um, but we just have to do it in such a way it takes half a millisecond uh, for every refresh. Whereas traditionally, you can take days or hours. And um, so it's just a new technical challenge. But the technology is, is, is kind of there. Uh, it's not easy, but it's, it's, it's kind of there. The other challenges, uh, which are actually trickier, you know, regulatory, policy, et cetera, yeah. All right, well, we'll come to those a little yeah. bit later. You had mentioned at the beginning you made decisions to keep users safe that cost a lot of money. Yeah. What are some examples of those? Uh, sure, uh, there's many examples. So, um, uh, well, I'll give you the most recent one. Um, so, UST Luna crashed. So now the old Luna uh, becomes Luna C, or Luna C, or whatever. Um, and we're not involved in that project. Um, but then because of users' demand, we said, okay, um, fine, they want to burn. We want to help the users. What can we burn? We can burn our trading fees. So now all the Luna C trading on Binance fees, we burn. Uh, the first week, we burned 1.8 million US dollars. That, that would have been our income. Uh, we burn it every week um, since a couple of months ago, since like a month and a half ago. Um, so that's one latest example. I'll give you an early example. Um, we started in July 2017. Um, we, I, was in, I was in Shanghai at the time. Um, September 4th, China said no crypto exchanges, no ICOs. Anybody did the ICO have to return funds to, to, the, to the users. This is six weeks after we finished our ICO, uh, launched the platform. So we're, we're not profitable. We're, we're, we're a new startup. You know, we're buying servers, hiring people, et cetera. Um, and luckily, BNB was 6x the ICO price. It was like six US dollars or so. So mm -hmm. no one wants to return six dollars for one dollar. So we're OK. But because of our, we run a platform, we facilitated four other <laughs> ICO projects on our platform. Those projects actually went underwater mostly because of that announcement. Mm. Um, but now the project team don't have enough money to make the users whole. Um, we calculated the difference for the users on our platform. Um, the difference was six million US dollars. Um, it took about a five minute call for us. I was actually on a train, a team called me, said, should we use our money to cover it? Um, we said, yeah, let's, let's use our money to cover it. Six million may not sound like a big number today. Um, this is six weeks after we, st we finished our own ICU. We raised 15 million US dollars, one five. Hmm. Right? Um, so that's all the money we had at the, at the time. And we're, we're spending money, we're not profitable. So even if you had all that 15 million, um, six million would be 40% of our treasury in one go. Um, but we spend that, we spend that like, uh, to cover our users. Um, till today, that's the single largest spending percentage wise for Binance. Um, and so this is when the company is six weeks old. Um, and, uh, but uh, I kind of knew, but I didn't know how overwhelming the positive response was. So um, after we announced that, the media around the world covered, like, well, not media, like, you know, the, the crypto media. Crypto media, yeah. um, And then all the users came to us. A month, a month later, we were profitable. So, um, so at the time when that happened, we had about 30,000, 40,000 users. Um, a month later, we had 120,000 users, and we became cash flow neutral, or pro we became profitable. And uh, so, but at, the, not, but at the time of the decision, it wasn't an easy decision, right? Um, it's 40% of your treasury for a new startup. Um, yeah, so, but we, and there's many, many other examples. I can, I can, I can stay for, here for a day to talk about different examples. Yeah. But people know. Um, so throughout our history, we have always done this type of stuff. And actually, it always worked out. When we take our money to like, compensate our users um, and to protect our users, users always come back. And we, uh, when they come back, we get more users. We charge a little fee over the long run. We actually make more money. Yeah. So after the decision happened in China, yeah. Binance opened companies, offices around the world. Where is Binance today? And how should we think about, I think you were on CNBC the other day and you said, we're not a Chinese company. Right. Yeah. Okay. What are you? Where are you? So we're, the big offices are in Dubai and Paris. Dubai and Paris. Yeah. So we will soon have an office here in Cyprus. Okay. So uh, we'll, we'll have a, we'll, we have a, we'll have a, we'll need a, to have a larger team. We'll have a, we we'll have to have a presence here. So we got our registration um, um, last month. So uh, this is actually one of the main reasons for my visit. I want to visit the places that are crypto friendly. So we do now. We have fiscal offices, fiscal presence, and. Um, Companies, etc., in multiple places, but the bigger office today is Dubai. Interesting. Yeah. 
Let's switch gears a little bit to the current situation in crypto, which is a strange situation. I think simultaneously we have 3AC, Voyager, FTX, BlockFi filed for bankruptcy a couple of hours ago. Again, yeah. Again. again. <laughs> um, for those of us who are here in the Mt. Gox here, I think if you had asked me post Mt. Gox, if almost 10 years later, we'd still be having major exchanges blowing themselves up, I would have said, no, we wouldn't have, we would, we'd solve this. This was, Mt. Gox was a mark of industry maturity. And as the industry has gotten much bigger, as people are more knowledgeable about crypto, as the regulators know more, how did we manage to end up here again in 2022? Um, I think it basically just says we're still early in the industry, okay. right? So eight years ago, Mt. Gox, yeah, I was there. Um, so I learned about crypto in 2013. I, I still have money in, in Mt. Gox, so that's stuck. <laughs> um, so, uh, but uh, uh, we're still early. Uh, I think 2013, Mt. Gox was much, much bigger uh, than FTX, industry presence-wise. Um, and the industry is much, much smaller and weaker. And we survived that. Uh, we survived that just, you know, a lot of people got hurt, including myself. I still have like, you know, some small amount of money there. Um, and uh, <clears throat> 2013 was more like a Bitcoin industry, yep. right? 2017 were like the, 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 the L coin, the ICO industry. Now, any, you don't have to be a blockchain developer to issue a coin. Um, 2020, with a, with a DeFi um, boom, uh, Uniswap, uh, automated market makers and stuff. 2021, it's like NFTs. I think every, every, everybody here has, a, has an NFT thanks to you, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, um, um, uh, and uh, so then, then this metaverse, we don't know what it is yet, et cetera, uh, GameFi, et cetera. Um, so, and if you look at the regulations, um, 2017, when we started, 20, 2014, there wasn't that much regulation. But because Mongox happened in Japan, 2017, Japanese regulators started to license exchanges, and they, they're actually very restrictive. Um, they, limit the, they limit all the exchanges to list no more than 20 coins that they pre-approve. So that's why when DeFi happened, that, that didn't happen in Japan. So Japan, kind of over the last four or five years, they realized that they, lost, they kind of lost the industry. So that now they're opening up again. They're saying, like, okay, they, next year they're going to move to let exchanges list the coins that the, exchange, the exchanges decide. So um, they're opening up again. Um, so 2017, Japan was there, um, but there's no, not really much regulations elsewhere. Even today, if you look at US, we're not sure if SEC or CFTC can regulate crypto, we're not sure yet, right? Uh, so we're still not very clear. But over the last couple of years, uh, more regulators around the world are looking at this industry much more intently, um, and they're looking at us. Um, so we know that quite well. Uh, but um, up until May, up until the Luna UST instant, most of the regulations were f very focused on KYC and AML, yep. um, which is very important. After Luna, they're looking at stable coins. They're looking at uh, loans, um, loan type of businesses. Now, after FTX, I would expect, I'm, we're pretty sure that all the regulators will be looking at user asset protection. Um, so now the industry is shifting. So, um, and, but even then, we're not looking at many other things, um, listing frameworks, uh, customer dis dispute resolution, um, law enforcement collaboration. If, what, if, what happens if law enforcement of one country want to free some assets of a user of a different country? Um, and met, uh, Gamify, Metaverse, NFTs, all of this um, NFTs was specifically left out of the Mika regulation in Europe because it's too early. So um, not, I'm not saying that we should have all regulations for all of these things today, right? We, we're just early. Uh, we've got to let the industry evolve a bit so that we can understand how the, what the industry looks like and then apply regulations to it, hopefully sensible regulations that doesn't kill the industry. So um, yeah, so it just means that we're still early. So FTX still happens. Um, but, although, uh, but no matter how mature the industry is, you cannot prevent people acting badly. Right? If, a, if a guy, like, you know, there's, many, there's many rules about guns, uh, but if a guy just wants to take a gun and shoot innocent people, then that guy's just a criminal. So what happened at FTX is a very specific corporate governance problem for that company. Uh, it doesn't represent all of crypto. 
So it's not crypto industry that's the problem. Um, Madoff happened in, 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 um, uh, in, the, in, in Wall Street world. Um, this is 74 years after the SEC has formed. So, so it doesn't mean that just because there's regulation that Madoff doesn't happen. So, uh, uh, so I don't think it's, um, uh, it's reasonable to expect that there will be no bad players in human civilization. I don't think our civilization is not is that advanced yet. So I think regulations help. Uh, you put, it actually helps in the industry to, de to develop. It helps to produce, pr protect consumers, and it helps to apply consequences to bad players. Um, but yeah, mm, you, they will always be bad players that, that are tempted by greed, um, by shortcuts, etc. So mm, that's where we are. Yeah. So let's, let's dig into this a little bit, right? Because in the US, basically, you have the bit license in New York State, which is reasonably comprehensive, right? When it came out, people were upset that it was too comprehensive. Yeah. And effectively, in the rest of the country, money service business type yeah. regulation. They're not really exchange yeah. regulations. And Europe, today, it's effectively similar that its registration is KYC, AML oriented, plus or minus, I'm simplifying. But with Mika in 2024, we should have a more fully blown out framework for exchange regulation, yep. right? You operate in multiple countries in Europe. You have Binance in the United States as well. How do you see this evolving? Will the US move more to the New York model? Will you see federal legislation around that type of model? How do you see it's going to? I, my sense is there's going to be a response post FTX, right? right? So what's your guess on what's going to happen? Um, I think as an industry, we're always learning, right? So industry players are learning, uh, regulators are learning, users are learning. So I think everyone's learning. Uh, we, as, a, as a civilization, we're, we're learning. So um, there are some really interesting differences. Um, I think US, uh, uh, given that Coinbase IPO'd um, on NASDAQ, and <laughs> assume, assuming with the SES, SEC approval, et cetera, so that's kind of viewed as the model, license model. But they use traditional licenses other than New York, right? So it's MSB license in most states. So Binance US, which is, a, which is an independent company from Binance.com, um, they have 44 state licenses in the US, um, MSB licenses. Um, so US adopts that model. And it's interesting that US actually have the best banking support for cryptocurrency exchanges, yeah. right? So in the US, uh, crypto exchanges like Binance US or C Coinbase or whoever else, <laughs> Um, they integrate with the SEH protocol. Um, you can deduct, exchanges can deduct from users' bank accounts automatically each month. Um, the user only have to authorize once at the very beginning. And to be honest, uh, the system have no restrictions. If, if you have a bug, you can actually deduct more. Yeah. But of course, that, 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 that would not be... And yeah. FTX, after the crash, they were still trying to deduct money from users' bank accounts. Uh, this is ACH for you, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, but most other countries don't have that level of uh, banking support. Uh, for, crypto, for crypto businesses. But US have uh, more restrictions on um, other products, like you know, futures, derivatives, um, interest, genera uh, interest generating products, et cetera. So, um, and then there's the debate between the SEC and CFTC, who's gonna regulate, et cetera. So there's, there's a little bit of that. Uh, US is a large country with the multiple agencies. Whereas in many other smaller countries, it's much simpler. Uh, there's usually just one regulator, and they just does everything. Um, and you don't have this sort of who's regulating this industry. Um, some countries view crypto as more of a commodity. Some people view it as a currency. So there's still this, um, different views on what crypto, uh, crypto is. And I think we need a couple of years to evolve so that people understand that crypto has many. Th crypto is not one asset type. Um, crypto, there's many different, there's crypto, there's probably crypto commodities, crypto securities, crypto utility tokens, and many other things that, um, that are there. So um, Mika is going to kick in probably in a year or two. Um, I think that's a very good thing. Um, it, um, and so now we have different uh, frameworks to compare globally. Um, a Southeast Asia is more, um, I would say, diversified. Um, they have different uh, regimes in different places. Um, and then you have you know, uh, Latin America and Africa, which are uh, also looking at different regulatory frameworks. So right now, we're still very early. Um, different people are trying different things. But I think Mika's 
quite uh, comprehensive quite, and quite good right at this moment. But you know, uh, Japan's now opening up. Um, they're, 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 they realized that their, their, their regime is a little bit too restrictive. Um, and that's a good thing, right? So now, now, now they'll change. So um, we're going to see this evolve over time. Um, it's quite interesting to, to see, actually. Yeah. But it's quite difficult for a global, global business to interface with so many different rules. But you know, we're hanging in there. Because yeah, they could be contradictory at some points, right? Yes. But uh, luckily, we can segregate most of the ge by geography. And mo most majority, of the majority of the users we can segregate by, by ge geography. Um, there are a small group of travelers which makes it a little bit more difficult, yeah. My simple summary of what you just said, the US, I think, does have the best plumbing for crypto, much more than Europe does. But because of the SEC and the Howey test, limits products substantially. Yeah. Europe, with the Mika, should actually have a quite competitive framework, but then the general business infrastructure and framework is weaker. And you'll have, you know, I think it's going to be harder in many countries to get banking, for example. Yep. Not, a, not whether you can direct, direct debit, whether you can get banking at all. Yep. Is that a fair assessment of at least the U.S. and Europe? I think that's fair, yeah. It's quite a bit harder to get banking support in Europe. Yeah. Okay. Let's go back to the question of bad actors, because you're right. Anyone can do anything. Yep. But we're in the land of public blockchains. It shouldn't have been the case that FTX could be moving user money for long periods of time with nobody noticing. As you say, you ultimately real-time settle on a blockchain. How should that change now? I know you're doing some work on proof of reserves. Yeah. Others are as well. Yeah. Arguably, this should have been done a while ago, but yeah. where, where are we now? What's best practice going to look like in six months? Yeah, so um, I think uh, going forward, um, now proof of reserves was actually there from 2013, 2012, or even earlier. Um, I did a proof of reserve for the exchange I was working at in 2014. Um, so it's not a new concept, but the concept did upgrade over a, a few times. And we're working, actually, we're working with Vitalik. He wanted to use um, uh, a new uh, mechanism to, to make it even, even, even more transparent and even more um, uh, safer. So um, um, I think in six months, every exchange will have to do it. Otherwise, users will not use them. Um, and this actually makes the crypto industry business much, much more reliable and transparent than traditional banking worlds. Um, if you store $100 in a bank, that $100 is not going to stay in a bank. Uh, all banks are fractional reserves. Um, so they take the money out and hopefully invest well so that they can return your principal plus some interest, et cetera. Um, but we, there's a word called bank run for a reason. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if everyone wants to go to the bank try to withdraw money, that bank will not have that, that much money. So um, 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 I think in the crypto world, given, the, given what's happened, crypto, especially crypto exchanges, actually going to be, become, well, we have always been 100% reserves. But the entire industry is going to be forced to become 100% reserves, which I think is actually super healthy. Uh, we do not need to take user money and invest to make money. Um, that's not our business model. Um, in, this new, in this new world, um, businesses are take, we're so much more efficient that uh, we just take a tiny fee on the user trading. And we can, we already, we're already sponsoring an entire ecosystem of development uh, of tools uh, that are almost completely free. You know, Trust Wallet is free. It's a decentralized wallet. Uh, no ads. Um, coin market cap. Um, we bought the platform and we removed all ads from the, we removed all revenue from the platform. Um, it actually had like $3 million revenue per, per month for, for, for ads. Per month? Uh, per month, yeah. So it's like a $40 million business. We, we, we moved it to a $0 business. Um, but now it's the user experience is much cleaner. Um, so that little bit of trading fee is actually enough to cover quite a lot of ecosystem development. And we're still profitable. So we're still very sustainable. And, um, um, so yeah, so business can be run much healthier, much more transparent in the crypto world going forward. I mean, I mean, banks are for actual reserve, but they have a lender of last resort, right? Which crypto doesn't. And so it, you kind of need to be this way, more transparent in crypto, right? Yes, but I think that lender of last resort, resort will increasingly work less well. Um, I think Luna tried it. Uh, Luna tried to print more Luna. 
uh, it doesn't work after a certain point. Sure. Yeah. That's probably not yet a threat for a major currency zone, do you think? Or is that what you're saying? Uh, not yet, but just the logic is a little bit flawed. Yeah. Right? You, can't, um, you, do, you, you, can, you can print money, but you cannot print value. Right. Yeah. That, Agreed. So you will, you will work for a while, but the logic itself is flawed. Yeah. We're working on a concept here, uh, for the benefit of the audience, which are of reg tech, of if you have a model where things are proving out on the blockchain on an ongoing basis, then maybe regulation can go also from being batch to also being real time. Do you think that's plausible? Do you see that within a one or two year time frame or a five to 10 year time frame? So which one going from batch to real time? The regulatory review, right? So ah. if you think about bank regulation, yeah. the auditors make an audit, they go to the central <laughs> bank. I actually see some auditors here in the audience. Yeah. Someone reviews it. It's periodic. Yeah. But in something like crypto that moves 24-7 irreversible settlement, where you can see moment by moment what's happening, could you imagine a world where regulation itself becomes semi-automated and follows that? Absolutely, yeah. So I think um, in the future, um, banks should do pr blockchain proof of reserves too, right? Um, and well, your fractional reserve, which is fine, but at least people should see that you're 20% or 10% or 2%. Um, and um, um, as blockchain businesses become more transparent, um, the traditional business will have to compete with that level of transpar transparency. Um, so auditors are great, um, but uh, more and more people, now there's choice. So um, you know, before the internet, people are happy with uh, postal uh, letters. Um, and, but with the internet, there's, there's gonna be choice. But before, before digital cameras, people are fine with paying for film. But now, as the technology evolves, uh, you have to compete. So um, I think uh, any place that increases transparency is good. And that teaches people, that uh, also trains certain behaviors and expectations going forward. So um, there will be spillover effects in a good way to make everything more transparent. And um, there's no reason banks could not use blockchain technologies. Uh, the technology is not against banks. Um, the, the, the technology is very, very neutral. Um, so mm, they should use the technology. Yeah. Taking even a step further, we now have DeFi protocols, AMMs, where it's effectively an exchange and it just runs fully on chain, no counterparties. How do you see their future? What are their pluses and minuses versus a centralized exchange? And so on. Yeah, I think DeFi works. Um, you know, this automated market maker model works. Um, the, the, the business model, the economy model, the, the economics, you know, you lend money to, the, to a pool that's used to make mark, provide liquidity, people trade against it. That's th those fees and um, little slippages get, goes back to pay for interest for the, for the people who loan the money. It's, it's, it's a, um, that's a closed loop that works. So I think that model will stay. Um, that model will grow. Um, so, and I think in the future, DeFi will be bigger than CeFi. So um, in the future, you know, I don't know when, but sooner or later, um, DeFi will be bigger than Binance.com. Uh, um, so we invest very heavily in DeFi uh, technologies and DeFi projects. Uh, we, want to, we want to invest in the things that may disrupt what our current bread, bread maker. Um, but we're not, we're not tied to our brain maker. We're, we're, very, we're very happy that if that thing goes away, we, there's always more opportunities in the future than there were in the past. We'll, we'll, we'll find some, something else that will generate income. Similar to that, you have your own smart contract platform. Yeah. Where does it fit in the landscape? There's Ethereum, there's Solana, there's your... When would someone think I should use one versus the other? What are the trade-offs? Um, so uh, today, the BNB smart chain uh, is a higher capacity, higher performance uh, uh, blockchain than Ethereum. So the gas fees are much lower. Um, so as a result, uh, we see many retail guys using it. The guys who want to transfer $30 uh, use, use, uh, use that. Whereas on um, Ethereum, very often, the gas fee is $9. Yep. Um, so if you want to transfer $30, it doesn't work that well. Um, and then on Ethereum, we see that the high-valued, well, they used to be high-valued NFTs, um, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars. Um, so they're okay with paying a $10 NFT, uh, $10 gas fee. Uh, whereas um, uh, 
B and B smart chains more like um, the retail guys, that little transactions. So for this reason, we see that the daily active addresses on B and B smart chain is much much higher um, than the other blockchains. Uh, we try to make tools for people to use, um, and B and B smart chain is only one blockchain that we like we help kind of contribute to. Um, there's the BNB Beacon chain, which is a native um, uh, the B, uh, BNB chain that's kind of based off Cosmos uh, ar architecture. Um, I think we just want to we just want to sponsor more and more projects, um, doing more and more blockchain development. Um, and it can be anything; it can be blockchains. Um, there's actually, we're sponsoring a third team um, working on a third blockchain that's also going to use BNB as a native token. Um, so BNB was, is actually one of the very few coins that's on the native coin on multiple blockchains. Um, and nothing wrong with that, right? So we're just giving money to, to sponsor those developers. And um, so th those developers, they, they want to build technology. The more, uh, we're, we're, we're at the beginning of an industry. Uh, the industry adoption is somewhere, somewhere between 0.5 to 5%, depending on how, what metrics you use to calculate it. So based on this level of uh, uh, early adoption uh, phase, or n not even early adoption, we just want to build as give as many choices as we can and see which one sticks. Um, and multiple ones will stick, I think. So um, I think you know um, we support multiple projects. Uh, we support we support obviously multiple blockchains in the space. Uh, we support multiple wallets. We support multiple centralized exchanges in the in the in the in the industry. So um, yeah, so we just want to help people to build tools uh, in the ecosystem. So we don't view ourselves as one single player that has to compete. Um, our exchange works with multiple blockchains. If there's only one blockchain, then the exchange is less attractive. Right. Um, our blockchain works with uh, the the blockchain is a decentralized ecosystem. They multiple blockchains list BNB and different uh, integrate with multiple blockchains. Our wallet system we have we invest in multiple wallets, um, not just Trust Wallet. Trust Wallet is one of our major ones. So we we, we talked about that a lot more. But the wallets work with multiple blockchains, multiple multiple exchanges, and multiple developers. So everything works with everything else. Um, we just want to help to grow the system, uh, the ecosystem. Interesting. What is your internal firm view on the adoption rate? What is that? It depends how you look at it. What? Uh, how do you think about it? Um, I think if you look at like um, how many how many people have some kind of crypto, that's yep. probably around three to five percent. Um, so if you grab a random 100 people off the street, uh, probably three to five people have bought... Anywhere one. in the world? Um, different countries are a little bit different. Um, three to five percent is your global view? Uh, global view. Okay. So um, I think there's probably around 500 million people who have bought some kind of crypto uh, so far. Um, so out of eight billion, that's about five percent or so. Um, um, <clears throat> but if you ask of that... Five, let's say five percent. Um, different countries are a little bit different. Like you know, some countries are much higher. I think Turkey is much higher. Um, uh, some countries are lower. Um, and but if you ask that five percent, what percentage of their net worth is in crypto? Right. So probably on average less than ten percent. Mm -hmm. So um, so if you ten percent of five percent is probably 05 percent global net worth wise, we're below 05 percent adoption. So that's that's why I said 0.5 to 5 percent, somewhere in that range, depending on which number you use. So in terms of total value in in crypto, th today most of the value is still in fiat traditional financial systems. So for the adoption to happen, we need to build bridges between the two so that the 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 the, the, the flow can come both ways. Um, so this is why we we structure Binance, uh, especially Binance.com, as the bridge between the two industries. Um, so uh, it's not so much a pure crypto. Um, uh, uh, Binance.com itself is not, but uh, we we sponsor many developers who develop BNB chain. Um, that's a pure crypto thing. Um, so yeah, so we we kind of we kind of do all of these things. How do you think CBDCs are going to impact this? Um, it's interesting. I think there's different levels of impacts. Uh, there's good and bad. The potentially good and bad, and there's also pros and cons. Um, most CBDCs. Especially the first versions will be unlimited supply, very similar to the to the to the to the current paper currency uh, we have. Um, so the government will be able to print. Uh, it's actually much faster for them to print. They press a key that's like doubles, right, um, or triples, or quadruples. Uh, <clears throat> and then um, um, most of them will be permission. That meaning that you want to, if you want to move a significant amount of money from one country to a different country. There's probably going to be a lot of scrutiny, a lot of uh, uh, approval uh, uh, processes involved. 
Um, and so there will be some restrictions compared to like you know native cryptocurrencies. You know, with Bitcoin in your you know, your wallet, you you fly to the next country. You don't even need, you don't even need to transfer. It's still on your phone. Uh, it's just now kind of conceptually in, in in the next country with you. Um, uh, and um, but central bank digital currencies do serve a few pr positive purposes. Um, it's forced adoption, right? So when central banks issue it, merchants will have to adopt it. So that's great for the, for adoption. And then there's uh, education, right? So now the the governments are educating all their population about cryptocurrencies, uh, blockchain, etc., how to use wallets. Um, it's um, uh, so it's uh, it's and and if those are allowed to to for us to integrate with, it's actually much better than going through banks. Um, so then we integrate with the blockchain, we're done. Um, people can deposit and withdraw um, via currencies. So if they allow that, then that's great. They may or may not allow that. Um, so for example, the CBDC that's being piloted in China doesn't allow that. So um, it's a closed system closed still. System. It's a closed pilot. We can understand. It, it, they, can't be, they can't open it in, in, all in one shop. So, um, uh, and what that, so there's pros and cons. Uh, so you will help, I actually do think it will help adoption. And then there's, there's the worry that in the industry, um, um, with a central bank digital currency, then now they can track every single transaction much, much more transparently. Before, they actually have to subpoena banks and get all that data together somehow in some data warehouse. Uh, but now, every single transaction you make is on the blockchain, it's fully, tra fully tracked. It invites a little bit of um, uh, privacy uh, concerns, et cetera. So those things have to be worked out. So there's many different pros and cons there. Um, it does allow almost a level of complete surveillance uh, of uh, spendings, which you may or may not want. Um, so um, there's different considerations being considered. But I do think that um, as an industry, we should, we, should, we should encourage innovation. Um, and the negative sides of innovation, we should try to fix it. And we should try to address it with the future innovations. So um, uh, central bank digital currency is a type of innovation that we should still encourage. Um, so many crypto guys hate it. Um, but I'm of that view. Uh, we need to bridge the gaps. Um, so that's kind of my view on central bank digital currencies. Yeah. We're running a minute or two over. I do want to ask one last question from me, which is very abstract. It's 10 years from now. What does the world look like in crypto? Ooh, uh, very hard to predict. Right. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't even predict a week from now. <laughs> but, well, actually, two weeks ago, I couldn't, <laughs> pred <laughs> this week. I, I couldn't predict right now. So um, things change very quickly, but uh, very hard to predict very precisely what's going to happen. But the general, the general direction is clear. Uh, you cannot pre we cannot prevent technology innovation. Uh, this te technology is a concept. We can shut down Bitcoin. We can shut down the internet. There will be many other alternatives that will be that will be made, uh, because we know how to make internet now. We know how to we know how TCP/IP works. We can make a TCP/IP two. Um, so uh, once a concept is in hundreds of millions of people's heads, you can't erase that. Um, so you will you will just grow. Um, there's probably over a billion over a million people working in the crypto industry. So they'll just contribute. You guys are all doing NFTs and metaverse courses, et cetera. So you guys will continue to push this industry forward. So uh, the industry gets pushed in all, all, all parts of the world. So it will continue to evolve. Um, you can't shut this down. You, can't, you cannot shut down innovation. Um, so um, as the industry continues to evolve, more and more people are going to use it. Um, and given that you know, uh, the top cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, Ethereum, BNB, the limited supply, there'll be more demand. Um, so I can't forecast prices, but um, you guys can work it out yourself. Um, but so we will see more, but there will be more and more other newer type of cryptocurrencies that will come up that with new you know, innovative use cases. So um, I think the closest I can, I can say is just look at internet. Uh, that's probably the closest textbook example we have uh, for this new technology, which is also a network technology. Um, yeah, I think I said it before. Um, if internet was just a technology for transferring information, that's really all internet is, right? Uh, it's just TCP IP packets over the wire or over the, over the air. This new technology is a new technology for transferring value, right. right? And that's all this new technology is. But now this new technology is going to give us new ways to raise money, invest globally, transact globally, micropayments. Um, um, it's going to change the way we, we do business. 
uh, it's going to bring new business models that was not possible before. So, um, and I don't know what the future is going to look, look like exactly because uh, 20 years ago, I couldn't name Facebook, I couldn't name Twitter, I couldn't name those specific companies because that, those depend on those specific funders uh, or the teams to build the tools. And they didn't know 20 years ago what it's right. going to look like. Right. So, um, and um, uh, it's the same as this industry, but the, the general direction is very clear. It's a huge potential for, for us to build in this industry. So it's up to us, all of you guys, all of us to, to, to build it. Is there any last remarks you'd like to say before we, to the audience before we wrap up? Um, not much. I mean, just keep building. But also, my last remark is usually always on risk management. Um, it is a highly volatile industry. Um, so do manage your risk. Um, the way I describe it is um, uh, everybody's risk is different. Uh, your risk is if your investments went, all went to zero, will your life be impacted negatively? If the answer is yes, you invest it too much. Take some, take, uh, uh, go, go half it. And then ask that question again. And when you say, when the, when the answer is comfortably, if my investments are all gone, I'm still okay, then that's probably the right amount. And um, uh, don't be too greedy, don't be too hurried, and don't be too, don't be too panicky. Uh, the industry will be here 10 years from now um, and just building, building this industry. Yeah. Great, well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.